Jonathan, uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. Appreciate it. Well, why don't we start off with uh, you introducing your, yourself, your background, and sort of how you got to where you are today. Sure, yeah. So I am the interim director of the governance program at the R Street Institute, uh, which is a center-right think tank that uh, does a lot of work on free markets. Uh, we sometimes say um, low salience issues, I suppose, but the high complexity issues. So um, yeah, I also, my personal focus is on budgetary work. So I'm also the director of the fiscal and budget policy project at the R Street Institute, which is um, not always the, the a low saliency uh, work. It is uh, oftentimes very high saliency, depending on the time of year, I suppose. So, um, you know, my, my background is in economics. I have a degree in economics from Princeton. I, um, I've always been more interested in questions of political economy, I guess you could say, sort of along the fringes of economics. Um, questions of how do you apply the economic way of thinking, perhaps, to, you know, other, other research questions that aren't just strictly finance. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, I, I'm very interested in sort of the, the um, questions of governance, broadly speaking, but also questions about uh, how we budget at the federal level. I've always been very interested in the question of, you know, where does the government get all of the money that it has for, for all of these programs? How do we think about budgeting? Why do we have failures in, in budgeting um, in, the, in the public arena? And so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my background. I uh, previously had started uh, the Institute for Spending Reform, which did sort of research and education on uh, spending and economic issues. And uh, now I've been in our street uh, carrying the torch for my own work, as well as uh, leading the governance efforts of, of the department at, at our street. Great. In terms of the, the broad range of your research, you mentioned budgeting. Is budgeting the main thing? And are there different aspects of budgeting or other areas of research that you've been focused on? Yeah. So in, in my own work, I mean, I, um, you know, I do a lot of stuff with respect to the, the, the federal budget. Uh, some of that is, you know, how some of it is are, are rules based um, and sort of process changes. You know, what is the what is the best way that we could structure uh, budgeting at the federal level, setting aside, of course, whether or not some of those ideas might be politically feasible in the current uh, political environment. But I think there's a lot to be learned from uh, the way that states handle their budgets, the way that uh, foreign countries handle their, their finances. And, and then I'm also very interested in, in these questions of uh, transparency and accountability. I, I, I very much think that there is a disconnect between what people see happening in Washington, D.C and sort of, you know, who they hold responsible for those actions. I think there are a lot of people who look at Washington and they say, I don't like this that's happening, but I love my member of Congress or I love my president or, or whomever it may be. And they don't necessarily make the connection that some of these people that you may be voting for um, may also be the ones who are leading to outcomes that you don't like. And so I think that in addition to the question of how do we create a system whereby actors that are operating in that system, you know, perhaps go and, um, uh, you know, do the right thing, so to speak, or feel incentivized to do the right thing. There's also just this broader question of outside accountability and how do we, you know, increase awareness um, with respect to issues that are inherently very complicated. I mean, policy is very hard. Um, encouraging better governance is very difficult. Encouraging better budgetary outcomes is very hard. And so I think there's also this sort of broader question that I'm very interested in, which is, you know, how do you start to incentivize these actors both by creating a better system, but also by creating better outside accountability um, to, to hopefully, you know, take into account some of the budgetary implications, um, you know, into, into the actions that they're taking. So why don't we start off with talking about the budget process itself? Obviously, it's undergone changes you know, over the last decades um, with a few major inflection points. You know, in terms of your perspective on how the budget sort of works today or doesn't work, if you will, can you kind of outline that generally speaking? And then maybe we can get into a little bit of what are the, what's the philosophy behind that process or what it should be? Sure. So yeah, let me, I guess, talk about how the process should work and then we can talk about how it, how it does work. So essentially you can think of government spending in, in two buckets, uh, what are typically called mandatory spending or entitlement spending, um, and then discretionary spending, which is sort of everything else. And so uh, in, in a sense, um, a good portion of the federal budget is sort of reviewed every year by members of Congress. So 
the president typically presents a budget. Congress creates its own budget. Uh, sometimes, you know, one version in the House, one version in the, in the Senate. And then uh, that governs all of the non entitlement programs. So for a second, we're setting aside things like Social Security and Medicare and, uh, and some of these programs. Um, and so, so Congress is supposed to review that every year. Um, that, and, and then we have a two step process uh, whereby spending is first authorized and then it's appropriated. And you can just think of that as, you know, uh, the first step is saying it's okay to spend on this. And then the second step is saying, okay, this is how much we're actually going to spend. And so that's the discretionary portion of the budget. Beyond that, we have these other programs, which we're all familiar with, again, Social Security and, and Medicare being the, the two biggest examples, where that spending is not reviewed. So essentially, uh, you know, prior laws dictated benefits that would be paid out by these programs. And it's essentially a formula, right? It's based on how many people we have who are above 65, typically, or above 62, um, and, and how many who are eligible for, for Medicare. Uh, and for Social Security. And those, those benefits are just paid out. They're not reviewed in any way by, by Congress on an ongoing basis. And so historically, uh, you know, the, the automatic portion of the budget, if you will, was actually very small. Most, most of the federal budget was reviewed by, by lawmakers on an annual basis. Over time, that has changed whereby uh, Social Security and Medicare in particular have grown such that they now comprise about two thirds of the entire federal budget. And so an increasingly small portion of the budget is being reviewed on a regular basis. And the biggest portion of that, that segment of the budget is defense spending, which we're all familiar with. And so um, there have been, I think, a number of ways in which the budget process has broken down. One is that a lot of spending just isn't being looked at anymore, right? Uh, you know, we're not really saying, you know, taking a holistic picture of the budget if Congress is really only reviewing about, you know, a third of it every year. And then with respect to the part that they should be reviewing, there's been a number of breakdowns. So, you know, I mentioned earlier this two-step process with respect to authorizations and appropriations. One of the things that's supposed to happen is that those appropriations bills, there's typically about 11 of them, although that has varied through time, are supposed to be, again, reviewed and voted on by, by Congress. Um, the problem is that they oftentimes set that aside and then just end up bundling all of those bills together into one package, what's typically called an omnibus bill, and they just vote on up or down. And essentially, your choice, if you're a legislator, is to say, I either approve of all of this spending or I wanna shut the government down. And, and so that choice basically makes it very difficult to examine expenditures at the federal level with, you know, I think a discerning, a discerning eye. And so um, the budget process in general over time has just broken down. In fact, we haven't followed that appropriations process that I mentioned uh, the way it's supposed to be since I believe it's 1994. So it's been, it's been now, you know, over a quarter of a century. And so, um, you know, what's happened is we've created an accountability problem over time, and that, that has manifested itself in some of these ways. I mean, another great example of a problem that we have is that, um, you know, typically Congress would authorize spending for a set period of time with the idea that they would then have to reauthorize that spending. They would review it from time to time. Well, an increasing portion of the discretionary budget isn't even reviewed. In fact, you know, appropriators will just tend to continue to appropriate funding for programs where their authorization has, has run out. And so now I think it's about 20 to 25% of the discretionary budget isn't even being authorized or reviewed by authorizers. You have famous examples, uh, you know, the Federal Election Commission or uh, the State Department being great examples where, you know, I believe the FEC hasn't actually been, been reauthorized since before I was born. So maybe that tells you something about my age. But uh, so you have all these different ways in which the process has broken down and there isn't really adequate oversight. And so that's not to say, of course, that the budget process has to work this way. There are things that we could do to improve that process. But to the degree that these are the rules and this is the framework that's been laid out going back to, to 1974 when sort of this, this process was outlined, um, we're just not following it. And we've had, we've had a breakdown. And so there's, these are interesting research questions, I think, for um, people like myself to, to, to ask, you know, why has this breakdown occurred? What should the optimal structure look like? What are the steps that we can take that are maybe politically feasible that could improve the budgetary process and hopefully 
uh, try to rectify some of these issues that we've been dealing with. So you've outlined the process, how it's theoretically supposed to work now and how it's sort of broken down. How did it work prior to the 70s in the US? You know, what was the evolution of that process you know, from the beginning? Uh, if you have any of that historical context, what have you learned from that? And I guess the other follow-up question to that is how you mentioned earlier, the international side of things, how do other countries do it and how are they either more or less successful than the US? Sure. So historically, that process tended to be a lot, a, a lot less centralized. A lot more of the power uh, lay with the heads of committees and subcommittees to figure out the budgets in their respective jurisdictions. Um, you know, over time, that became more centralized, and, and there's sort of an open debate about whether or not the 1974 Budget Act, which is the, you know, the, the founding, I guess, or seen as the foundation for the current budgeting process. Um, you know, created something new or just codified trends that had already been occurring before. And, there, you know, there's open debate on that topic. But, um, but over time, that process has been centralized. Um, you know, your, your viewers might, might think to themselves, well, 1974, that's an interesting time. There was obviously something well known that was going on at that time, which is the Watergate scandal. Uh, and so one of the ways in which, uh, you know, the 74 Budget Act changed the process significantly is that Theoretically, it, it stripped the president of a lot of power that had existed before. And so um, the president had most notably the power of impoundment, which basically said that he or she could, could take funds that Congress had appropriated and decide not to, not to spend them on that purpose. Um, you know, it was argued that the Nixon administration abused that power specifically by using the impoundment power to try to scuttle the creation of a new department, the, the Environmental Protection Agency. And that went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled that yes, the, the power had been abused and uh, Nixon in, in a sense, in, in an attempt to uh, you know, distract or, or perhaps uh, curry favor with Congress, uh, you know, with these the sort of potential um, impeachment hearings that seemed to be on the horizon prior to his resignation, uh, signed into law an act that, that um, gave a lot more power, at least theoretically, to Congress. But, you know, as we know, uh, you know, rules only get you so far. People learn how to circumvent those rules and how to uh, just generally not abide by them. And over time, again, we've seen a breakdown in a process that, you know, may have been, may have been good at the time. I mean, I was involved in some research that looked at, you know, what, what role did the 1974 Budget Act play uh, in the in, in you know, sort of spending and, and fiscal outcomes in the United States. And what you find is that compared to other countries, there is actually some evidence that in the short term anyway, in the, in the late 70s, we had more responsible fiscal outcomes. Uh, and, you know, you can, you can debate, of course, whether or not that was due to the 74 Budget Act specifically, but um, you know, there are modeling techniques that allow you to analyze that question with a certain level of rigor. And there is some evidence that, that it did have the desired effect. Uh, the problem is that over time, you see, again, the breakdowns that we've already talked about, but also things like, um, you know, currying favor to states where you ensure that grants get distributed to states that might be politically connected based on who happens to be in power. And so there are different ways in which the process has been, um, you know, politicized, I guess, and, and been taken advantage of. Um, to answer your question about how other countries handle things, one of the you know, one of the debates that we often have in this country is over the debt limit and whether we should raise the debt ceiling. I think we're all familiar with these debates. And uh, an interesting fact that I don't think many people realize is that uh, the United States is actually one of only two countries that has a debt ceiling process. The other is, is Denmark, uh, which implemented their, their debt limit in the 1990s. I believe they've only raised it once, uh, but no other country in the world attempts to manage uh, their debt and their expenditures based on this type of rule. And the history of the debt limit is, is quite fascinating. In the United States, it was implemented uh, in World War I because uh, prior to, to uh, about 1917, Congress had to approve every single debt issuance that Treasury wanted to issue. And you can imagine in a time of war that got very cumbersome and uh, you know, Treasury was constantly having to go to Congress and say, well, we wanna issue more bonds for this war. And so finally, Congress said, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna create a level whereby you can issue bonds uh, up to this point. And then if you want to go above that, you have to come back to us for approval. And so uh, in a sense, the debt limit was actually meant as a tool to enable more debt, not to serve as a restraint on debt, which is how you know many people, I think, think about the debt limit today. 
And so over time, you know, that process, of course, you know, the debt limit is constantly raised. Um, and it's it, in part because it's, it's kind of a bad way of managing your debt. It's basically saying we've already spent this money, but now are we going to pay or are we, are we not going to pay? And, you know, you, of course, wouldn't do that with your own household finances once you, you know, it, it, you know, you, uh, you don't sort of look highly upon people who say, well, I'm going to put all these charges on my credit card, but then decide not to pay it after the, after the fact. What most countries do in, 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 in brief uh, is they either have some sort of, you know, constitutional or statutory requirement that says we are going to restrain expenditures, oftentimes as part of a formula. So they'll have some sort of fiscal rule that looks at past expenditures, looks at that expected tax revenues, usually over a, a, a you know, a, a decent window of time, a you know, three to five year window, and they'll have some sort of formula that says this is what we're allowed to spend. But there's no restraint on finance ministers to be able to go and, and borrow if necessary to deal with, you know, shocks to the system, for example. Um, the, the, the restraint comes on on the expenditure and, and, and the revenue side. And so it's much more upfront. It's preventing you from, uh, from you know, having those expenditures occur in the first place rather than trying to, to stop them on the back end. And um, you know, I should say, I, I, you know, while, while I'm certainly not a fan of, of the debt limit as a, a, a restraint on, on government, you know, it, does, it has served a purpose in the United States in that many of the the, um, the situations where we've had, you know, new rules or, or some level of restraint um, has typically come out of debt limit brinksmanship or debt limit fights. So if you look at the Budget Control Act in 2011, that came out of a debt limit fight. If you go back to, you know, the early 90s, um, 1990, 93, uh, in, or go back to, you know, Graham Rudman Hollings in 85, um, all of these things tended to come out of uh, debt limit fights. And so it has served a purpose in terms of Focusing people's attention on uh, on fiscal uh, you know fiscal questions. So, what about the uh, authorizations and appropriations duality? Uh, does that exist you know in the U.S. deep history or in other countries, or is that something unique to the current Congresses? Yeah, so that's one of those things that sort of did exist in a in a um, in the United States in this decentralized way, but uh, again got codified in 1974. Uh, I'm not sure the degree to which that two-step budgeting process exists in other countries. I'm not aware of any other places that necessarily do it that way. Um, there have been proposals to combine uh, authorizations and appropriations. Like, again, there's no reason why it has to be done that way. Um, I think the original reason for it was to, again, create more accountability to, to you know, separate those two steps and allow uh, you know, power to be distributed in a way where where uh, multiple uh, you know, segments of, of Congress could kind of have oversight. The way it's played out in practice over time, and certainly today, that hasn't really been, been the case. And you know, I, I mentioned the problem of unauthorized appropriations being the best example of that, where we just kind of ignore the authorizers overall. So um, you know, getting a change to that system is very difficult because you know, appropriators, of course, know that they have that power. And so giving up that, that power would be very, very tough. Um, there have also been proposals recently to uh, allow authorizations or even appropriations to take place over multiple years, uh, which uh, has you know pluses and minuses to it, which you know we can certainly talk about. But um, so you know, I think that uh, the the problems we see with that two step process isn't really driven by the existence of the two steps per se. Uh, it's sort of a symptom of these broader issues that we've been discussing. In terms of the um, formulaic approach that you mentioned that's pursued by other countries, mm -hmm. obviously the US employs a little bit of that, I think, with some, some kinds of cost of living adjustments or whatever in some of the entitlement programs. But can you explain, you know, when you're thinking about a framework to look at the budget, obviously you can look at, look at it as um, in, in the ways you've mentioned previously, but there are a lot of other ways you could frame a, a view of the budget. You could say, oh, you know, we're willing to spend X as a country, X percent of the budget on, uh, you know, productivity kind of enhancing investments. Mm -hmm. And we're willing to spend Y on police and we're willing to spend a Z percent on redistribution, for mm -hmm. instance. And you could frame the budget in all kinds of different ways. And it seems that we have chosen a particular way can you talk a little bit more about that and whether other countries uh, or even in the past U.S. history, whether they framed the budget in a kind of a different, uh, use a different approach to frame the budget process? Sure. 
So I think first we should uh, we should clarify what we mean when we talk about the budget process because uh, you know there's a conception that the budget itself is sort of the most important step, um, but the budget is really just a blueprint. Uh, and in, in the United States, there's no there's no force of law to a budget. So Congress could decide. You know, the budget committees could come out and they could say, um, you know, we propose a budget of zero dollars next year or they could say we propose a budget of a hundred trillion dollars uh, and congress could even vote on that uh, they could approve that budget and it really doesn't mean anything because at the end of the day it really comes down to how much uh, how much expenditures are being authorized and ultimately being appropriated and so uh you know congress can sort of put out that budget and that's why you know budgets have largely become messaging documents where you'll have you know presidents put out their budgets uh, which are, you know, highlight maybe what is the priority for them, but then ultimately, you know, quickly being dismissed by even members of their own party in Congress when it comes time to look at those budgets. So um, what you're really asking is, you know, how do we better manage the finances? And it's possible that having a better budget would be a part of that, but it, it, it at least as we currently structure our system, isn't really that relevant. Um, the gold standard in the international sense is the Swiss debt break. So the Swiss have essentially a, a constitutional requirement that restrains what they are able to spend along the lines of what I described earlier, which is, you know, they, they basically look at, you know, what are our expected uh, revenues and what are our expected, uh, what, what do we think is a reasonable level of expenditures and they have a formula and they're not allowed to go beyond that. And, you know, there's, uh, I think it's important to note that there's a certain amount of flexibility that is built in. It's not like this is hard and fast, right? I mean, there may be a pandemic, for example, or, um, or some other shocks to the system that need to be dealt with. And, and there is a level of flexibility, but uh, while you're able to spend more, you know, to deal with that, um, it, it does also create sort of an automatic way to restrain expenditures in the future. And there have been there have been proposals in the United States to do something like this. Obviously, you know, talking about a constitutional amendment is very difficult. Um, the most recent example that's that's current is uh, Congressman Justin Amash of Michigan has proposed what he's called his his balance uh, his his business cycle balance budget amendment, uh, which would basically do something very similar to the Swiss debt break and would allow flexibility to. Uh, for Congress or, or, you know, to decide to, to spend more at, at certain points in time, at certain parts of the business cycle. Um, there are other countries, uh, Sweden, for example, has a similar type of fiscal rule. Theirs is done statutorily. So it's a slightly different model, although the history of their, their, uh, their fiscal rule is actually quite interesting. Uh, you know, they, they basically created this fiscal rule in the 1990s because they were facing a uh, an entitlement crisis. Uh, unlike you know their neighbors Norway, who sit on very large oil reserves, uh, Sweden doesn't necessarily have that benefit. And so, uh, while they had perhaps equally generous uh, entitlement programs, they got to a point where they weren't able to, to to pay for it anymore, and they had to impose some level of restraint. And they did that via a statutory uh, fiscal rule, which has served them well. Uh, there have been you know recent attempts to to roll that back, but um, but it, they, you know that has been how they have handled it. And then if you look at the state level in the United, in the, within the United States, we have all sorts of different rules. I mean, 48 out of 50 have a balanced budget requirement. Um, you know, budgets at the state level uh, are typically binding, uh, unlike at the federal level. Although uh, there are many ways in which you know governors and, and state legislatures are able to get around those requirements, not including certain bonds and things like this. Um, but, uh, and, and again, the way that it's, that it's uh, implemented at the state level varies you know, wildly. I mean, the most, the most stringent and, and, you know, for I think fiscal conservatives, what's seen as the best example is, is Colorado, uh, which has what's called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And it essentially operates very similarly to the Swiss debt break um, at, at the state level. And what's interesting about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is that uh, in instances where the state runs a surplus because of, you know, either economic reasons or otherwise having, um, uh, you know, just more responsible finances, they actually refund money to the population. And so it creates an incentive whereby uh, residents of Colorado uh, benefit from being more fiscally prudent. Uh, and so, you know, of course, that would be very difficult to implement at the federal level, but it is, it creates an entirely different incentive structure. And, uh, you know, people don't necessarily, I think, think of Colorado when you think of most fiscally conservative states, but without a doubt, uh, Colorado would rank up there and in large part because of Tabor, 
And while there have been times where the Taxpayer Bill of Rights has been, you know, paused, if you will, um, it has remained popular and attempts to get rid of it have, have failed. And so, uh, so those are just some examples of the ways in which, which states and, and, you know, other countries have handled these issues. So in that case, it seems like they're, they're connecting the, the appropriations ultimately to the revenues, right? There's some kind of uh, balance there. Um, whereas it seems that at least in, in the Congress situation, these two issues are totally divorced from each other. Um, can you correct. explain a little bit of that? I mean, one, obviously one of the reasons is because the U.S. can borrow at extremely low rates. And, you know, we've done some work even at the Sunwater Institute looking at, you know, the there's a logic to Congress borrowing as much as possible in order to satisfy its current voter base, right? Mm -hmm. There's a logic to that since uh, future voters aren't voting right now, they'll be voting later when the bills do. Uh, and I'm curious about the way that you view the debt and, and the revenue connection and how is that linked in the US Congress or how should it be linked? Right. So yeah, there are a number of things to say here. So one is that, you know, obviously, as, as you point out, the, the states don't have the ability to borrow essentially to an unlimited degree. I mean, you know, if, uh, if a state like Illinois decides to have an incredibly, um, you know, uh, um, I don't know, fiscally imprudent uh, budget, uh, that harms their ability to borrow in, in the bond markets. And so um, that creates a, a sort of a, a market-based restraint, I think, at the state level. Uh, and obviously, you know, different states can choose to, to, you know, pay those costs or sort of get away with it, if you will, to the degree that they want to. But um, the federal government doesn't have that problem. And, you know, we can obviously talk about things like the dollar being the reserve currency and, and you know, the uh, effectively the existence of the printing press and what that what that means, you know, it, it removes this sense of uh, what might otherwise be seen as a natural um, restraint on on the, on the federal budget. Um, so that's I think that's, you know, one of the one of the biggest differences that exists. And then I think there's this broader um, you know, again, you get at uh, an accountability problem that exists at the federal level because of that, um, you know, members of Congress know that it's in their interest to promise sort of something to everyone, uh, whether or not it is a good idea. And so it becomes very difficult to break that cycle. And then you end up with, of course, um, programs that are perhaps continuing to exist beyond the point of their usefulness. And so, you know, it's, it's very easy to add a government program by comparison to getting rid of a government program as, as you know, Milton Friedman famously talked about. And so, um, you know, that is, and, and again, you know, without there being this sort of cost, um, that is, uh, you know, that's, that, that's a, big, a big challenge at the federal level is how do you, how do you incentivize lawmakers to think about these costs, um, you know, whether they, because they don't necessarily exist at the current moment. The other, the other thing that exists even more so at the, at the federal level as a result of this lack of, you know, market restraint is that, you know, we oftentimes talk about the national debt, but the debt is just what the federal government has accrued up to this point. I mean, when you look at the financial reports of, of corporations, for example, you don't just look at what they've accrued now, you look at what they're on the hook for. Well, you know, a lot of these programs, uh, particularly the ones that are on, you know, on quote autopilot, um, have huge projected uh, deficits long out into the future. And so, you know, these, um, you know, these, these, but these liabilities massively dwarf the existing uh, U.S. debt. And so, um, you know, that is a huge problem as well. Is that you know, you're not just talking about the, you know the 20, 25, or, 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 you know, or well, I don't even remember what it is, the 26 trillion, I think, uh, national debt at this point, you also have all of these sort of deficits that you expect to accrue in the future that lawmakers are also not incorporating into their, uh, into their, their, their calculus. And the other point I'll make is that, you know, I think that people who are concerned about these issues, fiscal conservatives uh, in particular, often do a disservice by talking just about the debt. So, um, one of the reasons why I think people don't think about the national debt or, or to the degree that they should is because they see it as a problem down the road. You know, we hear this line from politicians all the time that it's, you know, we have to worry about our children and grandchildren and they're going to be the ones to pay for this. And, and that is all true, um, but it also, it also separates the problem and basically says that, well, it's an issue down the road. It's not an issue 
today. And I do think that, you know, on, on when you talk about the national debt, um, there is a lot that can be learned from the way we talk about climate change, for example. I think a lot of people recognize that, you know, climate change has the potential to be an existential threat down the road. And if you want to uh, mitigate that potential threat, you have to take actions now. And I think that, you know, I think of, I think of the debt in many ways as very similarly to, to these climate issues. But the other thing I'll say is that I think that people also ignore or at least downplay the role that um, increased public expenditures play in the short run as well. I mean, you know, yes, we borrow, um, but to the degree that, you know, uh, tax revenue has to pay for these programs, um, you're arguably, you know, potentially taking more money out of the economy today uh, and putting them into programs that may or may not be more effective. And, you know, there are certainly there are certainly things that government has to do that only they can do. I mean, national defense, for example. Um, but there are also a lot of things that government may not need to do. And we can we can have those debates. But as part of those debates, one of the things that we don't necessarily discuss is um, what that cost looks like. And it's not just the sticker price of those programs. It's also you know, how does it impact private sector actors? What are the burdens, you know, regulatory or fiscal that are imposed on, uh, on, on private sector actors and, and on the economy as a whole? And so there is very much a cost. It's not necessarily seen uh, as clearly, you know, we don't necessarily think about a potentially lower growth rate, for example, as being driven by, by government spending. And so we don't necessarily, you know, American voters and citizens don't necessarily think about it in those terms, but there is a very real cost. Um, it's oftentimes harder to quantify that exists in the short term um, that also is there that I think we, we probably need to talk about a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's a, a big topic for discussion is uh, evaluating the you know, the goals of programs and whether they meet those goals and how much they cost to achieve those goals and whether the goals are realistic, right? There's, there's lots of discussion that can go, um, that, that we can have about those things and mechanisms to enforce that kind of rigor. You know, we've talked about sunset provisions in the past and, you know, as an automatic mechanism to try to assess the, you know, the success or failure or the return that, that programs are supposed to provide and, and actually measuring that in reality. Um, what about in the budget process, generally speaking? I mean, you you dedicated a lot of time and energy to thinking about, you know, uh, authorizations, appropriations, budget process. Do you have ideas or, uh, you know, models that you think that we could learn from to improve Congress's process, to improve mm -hmm. uh, the likelihood of success? Uh, and, you know, responsible kinds of act actions by, by Congress? Yeah, um, I think, uh, so there are a lot of things to say. I mean, you know, some of the solutions are budget specific. So they are, you know, uh, I mean, there is a bipartisan uh, budget reform package that was advanced out of, out of, you know, the budget committee in the Senate, uh, where Senator Enzi and Senator Whitehouse both agreed to a number of reforms, uh, most of which I think would be positive. So, there are changes that could be made to the, the budgeting process. I also think that it's important to think about these issues in the broader context of how Congress operates as a whole, especially vis-a-vis -vis the executive and, and the other branches. I mean, we have a, uh, you know, a, a balance of power system for a reason. And you know, one of the things that the governance department at R Street talks a lot about and does a lot of work on is is you know, creating better governance and, and helping Congress in a sense to push back a little bit against what has been a general trend toward increasing executive power at the expense of, of the legislature. And so you know, the constitution vests the power of the purse with Congress, but oftentimes spending decisions are being made, uh, you know, apportionment decisions, for example, are made by the Office of Management and Budget or you know, these, these uh, micro spending decisions are ultimately being made by uh, relatively unaccountable or less accountable executive agencies rather than within the legislature. And so I think it's important from the rule standpoint to not just think about the budgeting process in a vacuum, but to also think about it uh, in this broader context of how Congress interacts with, with the presidency. And, you know, I think that over time, you know, we have seen we have seen the executive gaining more power sometimes because the executive has has taken that power and sometimes because Congress has let the executive take that power. And, you know, 
that's for a number of reasons, that, and, and, and it may even have been legitimate reasons at, at various points in time. But the the challenge that we have is that you know once that power is sort of gone, it's very difficult to to reclaim it. And so um, I think that it's it's important to think about you know these broader governance questions. And and part of the solution, by the way, is I, I think, and one of the things that our street has done a lot of work on is just increasing congressional capacity. That you know over time. Congress's ability to deal with these issues has has declined, um, and they don't have the capacity to be able to to do the things that they need to be doing. And so, as a result, it makes it very easy to say, "Well, we should just go and keep that power with the with the executive, even if that's not how the system was originally designed, and even if that's not what's best for uh, you know for good governance and and for the American people." So. Uh, I, I would answer that question, I think, by by saying that there are there are you know specific budgeting things, but there's also this broader context, and there needs to be a little bit of a reframing, and I think a broader understanding of of these these balance of power considerations that that we're dealing with. I mean, it, I think in terms of Congress itself and the capacity concept, um, you know, there's again there we need another framework, right? How much are you going to spend on Congress itself? uh in order to exercise its legislative and oversight functions right mm -hmm. and uh as we all know congress's budget uh for itself is has not grown with the amount of money that it's spent on things that the executive branch controls right. and so i don't know maybe you know the exact number but it's something it's less than one percent maybe 0.02 percent or something mm -hmm. of the u.s budget is spent on congress itself mm -hmm. right uh, and, you know, I often make the joke that if I were investing in something, you know, how much money would I then invest to watch that investment, right? Mm -hmm. I might invest 1%. I mean, if you look at the financial services industry, you have a management fee, you're paying typically 2% of assets, maybe less, mm -hmm. depending upon the, how active the manager is, you know, this industry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I wonder about when we talk about Congress's capacity to do these things and its ability to really dig into the details, what should Congress's budget be for itself? And should that be formulaically applied to the total amount that Congress is spending on the US government generally? And I don't know if you've given that any thought or whether yeah. you have some benchmarks from other countries or some insights there. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a, a specific dollar amount per se, uh, so much as to say that, you know, I, I am in the camp that thinks that, that Congress should get whatever funding is necessary to be able to carry out the duties that it, that it, it has to carry out under the Constitution. And it's, what's very clear is that we're not anywhere close to that right now. I mean, you know, to your point, I mean, the it's very easy to say, well, we should pay Congress less, um, you know, or pay staff less. Um, but in terms of the in the context of the entire federal budget, we're we're talking about pennies on on the dollar, and not even pennies on the dollar. And so, the uh, you know, I think I think it's very. Um, I mean, for example, I think we could spend more on you know even special inspectors general, and that's not even necessarily with respect in Congress, right? That would be in the executive branch. I would be in favor of that because I think that the the um, there the evidence is that the the dollars that you would save uh, from from that investment would be would be wise, and so I think there are all these examples, you know, not just with respect to Congress, but even in government writ large, where it may make sense to spend more because in the long run you will end up getting better outcomes. I, um, you know, I think as I said, I think paying staff better makes a lot of sense. We want to encourage people who have expertise uh, to actually go and um, and remain on the job and sort of be vigilant. You know, one of my one of my, my pet peeves is you'll hear you'll hear of offices sometimes saying that they returned money to the treasury for you know from from their office budget and they're saving the taxpayer money. Um, well, I mean that that may be true, uh, but it may not be true if they're ultimately less effective and at, at you know being vigilant with respect to these these issues if their if their ability to impact the overall all you know, federal budgetary picture is, is less as a result of that, and that might not be a wise investment. So I think what you're pointing to is the. The, the, the real question here is that you know, we should, the, the framework should essentially be some sort of uh, attempt at a cost benefit analysis. And whether you, you know, conceive it that way may not be the, the, it may not be the best way, but, but at the end of the day, it's really a question of what are we spending and what are we getting in return? And I think that the, the argument is that you know, when we spend on Congress, we get better outcomes because Congress is able to function better. Um, and specifically, it's able to function better vis-a-vis -vis the executive, uh, which has grown dramatically in power and, and Congress, in a sense, has not kept up or has arguably 
lost power in many ways. And so that I think is, is the big challenge. And, uh, and, and you know, my view is that generally speaking, the more competition you have between the branches, um, the, the, the better fiscal outcomes you're likely to get, the better governmental outcomes you're likely to get. Because, and, and that's of course the whole, the whole foundation of our separation of power system is the founders believe that you, know, you wanted to have branches that were adversarial and checking each other in different ways. And you know, I, um, I think there are a lot of people who, you know, we talk a lot about polarization, for example, in the, in the current political climate. Well, you know, partisanship is just one way in which you know, people can organize to, uh, to oppose one another's interests. Uh, you know, there's also, again, within the context of the government, there's also this, um, this you know, inter-branch rivalry that I think should exist that doesn't necessarily. And I think that we would be wise to incentivize, uh, you know, legislators and, and to think of themselves in that way. And I think some, some do. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and oftentimes you can move the ball forward on certain legislative priorities when people start to think about that, think about you know reasserting their their they need constitutional a, they need a common priority. they need a common enemy, right? And uh, yeah, instead right. of each other, right? I, th I think that's a it's an effective way to to create cohesion, right? But I think one one thing I do want to I guess as a last question on your specific research, unless you have something specific you want to uh, talk on, is the accountability piece you mentioned before. I mean, you've tried to do that I know through your website, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite interesting. Um, but it's tough to, first of all, create that accountability and second of all, communicate it to the ultimate deciders, the voters mm -hmm. you know, and, and what it means for them. So I'm curious your thoughts of that moving forward. How can we create this better accountability either to committees or to individuals, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to the voting public and get the public interested in paying attention to that? Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned at the outset that I think that there is a oftentimes a lack of transparency or a lack of a connection between outcomes and who is responsible for those outcomes. And so uh, the tool that I've built, Spending Tracker, spendingtracker.org, uh, essentially does the math and it, it takes official governmental estimates from the Congressional Budget Office and it just cross references them with the voting records of members of Congress and says, who is voting for what? And there's all sorts of cool things you can do. You can go in and you know look at um, just bills that were passed into law versus all votes that were taken, or maybe you just want to look at specific types of spending, like defense or education or, or what have you. Um, so there's all sorts of you know different ways you can play with the data, and I think get more interesting outcomes. And and that alone is important because I mean you know to be able to hold people accountable, you have to have that information available in the first place. And for a long time, it wasn't available. I mean. If you think about outside advocacy groups, I mean, you know, there's maybe the, you know, that half dozen or dozen, you know, pieces of legislation that everyone gets worked up about, and we sort of, um, we sort of think about on a, on a, you know, when they when they come up, but there's all sorts of other legislation that's being passed and enacted and voted on um, that may be spending less but still having an impact. I mean, you know, the the late Senator Tom Coburn used to say, you know, how do you get to this this level of debt? Well, you get it by by essentially, you know, the death of a thousand cuts, right? It's it's adding up all of these little things over time. And the the, the beauty of, of spending tracker is that it, it incorporates those um, you know, those those smaller impacts as well and, and gives you a total picture in a way that's more objective because it's not me saying these things are important. It's the Congressional Budget Office saying this is the best estimate we've got, and now let's just do the math. Um, so th that is the important thing. I mean, you're right that it's it's very difficult to get accountability, but I think it starts there. The other thing I will say is that um, it's not just about better information for the general public. It's also about better information for members of Congress and their staff and the people who are making these decisions. I mean, you know, when I first conceived of that tool, I didn't, I didn't, it never really occurred to me how valuable it might be for members of Congress. And, you know, this might even sound silly, but even something as basic as just taking, you know, CBO's estimates and plotting them in the form of a chart so that you can see what those, those fiscal implications look like over time is hugely valuable for, in terms of being able to understand, you know, what, what, the outcomes are and, and what the impact of, of your votes are. And so, you know, it, with respect to that tool, my, a lot of my focus has, has shifted or expanded to thinking about ways that we can provide better information to legislators as well um, to inform their decisions. I mean, one of the things that we're working on now, uh, in addition to uh, thinking about the broader debt picture and incorporating some of the, you know, the revenue estimates in addition to spending estimates, 
is making the tool more uh, prospective. So saying, you know, here's the congressional calendar, these are the votes that are coming up, this is what the impact would be on the federal budget so that you have that information ahead of time. Because the reality is, you know, most offices just aren't or, or you know, charitably don't have the time to read through and pour over official government estimates before they're taking those votes. Yeah, there's so much that can be done there. I mean, to give each office or each committee a set of tools, technologies to really assess the impact of legislation on the budget on individual people, you know, mm -hmm. in different districts, different states, you know, it's really shocking that it doesn't exist today, right? Uh, your average business has much better tools to make decisions than Congress does. And that's, that's tragic. And, and as a result, they have to rely on external parties, lobbyists or mm -hmm. groups to provide that information, which comes, you know, at a you know, it does, it's, un, it's not unbiased, right? And so that goes back to your issue about capacity. That's the key. And, well, and it's, it's very important too, as government has grown. I mean, I think that, you know, when, when government does so many things, it's very difficult to be an expert on things. You know, how could one person possibly be an expert on, you know, defense policy, but also agriculture, but also education? And, um, and so, as a result, what, what it does is because you, you may not be an expert in all of these areas, you essentially rely on, on heuristics. So you rely on leadership, for example, telling you to vote this way um, or you know, other, other sort of things that may not be, again, what you even agree with, but you just kind of do it because that's the way things have always been done. And, and you're right. I mean, the, the private sector has much better information. And I think, you know, until relatively recently, there hasn't been a whole lot of good data uh, with respect to, to what government is doing. And there have been a lot of people in this fight, you know, that have done a lot of great work from, you know, things like uh, making every, you know, CRS report, every Congressional Research Service report public to the passing of the Data Act and, and creating, you know, better access to data to um, just API access to votes that didn't exist prior to about 2009. And so there's all this kind of stuff and spending tracker, of course, fits into this, uh, you know, this, this broader movement. And I think that that the future of, of, you know, increasing governmental efficiency and, and sort of outside advocacy, in my view, lies a lot with increasing uh, access to data and increasing transparency. And, and that's not to say transparency is good in every context, but I think our bias should definitely be in that direction. Great. Well, let's move on to some of our, our other questions um, that, that I ask all of our, uh, all of our guests uh, so I can put them all together and see whether uh, congressional scholars all agree, <laughs> sure. uh, which will be an interesting um, exercise. So I'm going to move on to my, 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 uh, my round of questions here. So the first one is, uh, what do you think congressional representation should mean? Yeah, so I, I think that that gets to this this question that you know has been debated since the founders and the, and the, the framers about you know should you be uh, you know should you be a delegate to to do what you think is right or should you be representing the will of the people and I think that you know to some degree there's there's some balance there and I think the way to think about this question or, or uh, there are, there are a couple of ways to answer it one is just with respect to um, individual members and I think it's very tough to answer you know. Should someone be more of a, a, a you know a representative a representative of the will of the people, or should, are they being elected to kind of um, you know vote their conscience and do what they think is right? I think that in the in the context of all of Congress, it's good to have people who take different approaches, and that you know over time you that that's just another way that you get different perspectives uh, in in the legislative process, and so. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very tough question to answer. I think that there are arguments on, on different wings. I think, you know, on getting back to what we just talked about, about the, the difficulty of being an expert in all these areas, I think that, you know, I guess where I come down generally is that to the degree that, you know, someone may have, um, may have a, a unique, uh, you know, sense of a unique uh, knowledge set in a particular area, then, you know, you know it's perhaps in more based on that knowledge that they have and, and areas where they may not have that knowledge then you know defaulting perhaps to what they think is best for their constituents or their constituents may want may be the the, the better approach so I think it depends somewhat on the legislator and and what they bring to the table and uh, and then also just you know the the I think it's good to have a, a mix of people on that spectrum um, in in Congress as a whole so maybe if I can pin you down a little bit more. <laughs> since you've, you've hedged in a few different directions there. Um, 
the beliefs versus interests, what do you think, what's your personal uh, point of view on that respect as it comes to representation? Well, if, if I were a member of Congress, uh, you know, I would, I would vote based on, based on my beliefs. And I think that, you know, it's, of course, it's not. I don't mean your personal beliefs. I mean, the beliefs of your constituents. Do you, do you vote on the, your constituents' beliefs or your constituents' interests? Um, well, yeah, that, again, it's a, it's a tough question. I think, I mean, if I were in Congress, you know, I like to think that I would be elected because I would be a good representative of both of those, right? The, the interests and the beliefs of, of uh, the people that I'm representing. So, um, you know, I don't know, I think most of the time there isn't necessarily a disconnect between there. Um, I do think the, 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 where the disconnect comes up is when the interests of the district are not necessarily in the district, in the interests of uh, the entire country. Um, you know, oftentimes we have a lot of parochial, parochial, parochialism where uh, members vote based on their particular interests and not necessarily what is best for everywhere in the country. And of course, those outcomes have impacts everywhere in the country. And so, you know, I, uh, maybe I'm still hedging a bit, but I think it's, I think it's very difficult. I think that, you know, again, though, I will say that generally speaking, I don't have a problem with members voting based on the interests of their, of their constituents, because the foundation of our system is that, you know, it, it's sort of, it's sort of like a, 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 you know, a courtroom where you have the, you have the prosecutor and you have the defense attorney, uh, you know, uh, arguing for their size interests. And the hope is that the outcome that you're going to get is going to be, be be better because of that, you know, each side being assertive for their for their interests. And so um, while I, I am certainly sympathetic to people, you know, needing to take the broader interests of the co country at hand, um, I, I'm perhaps less concerned as, as some might be about people voting based on the interests of their just their their constituents, because I think that overall, you know, the, the, the faith that I have in the system is that, you know, we will we will sort that out in the con context of, of the broader system. All right. Next one is how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? Well, I think the obvious answer is more on policy. Um, I think it's, you know, over time, it's been very difficult for members of Congress to focus on policy. Um, part of that is because, you know, as we've said, you know, Congress and the government just does a lot more. Um, part of this because of trends we talked about earlier about, you know, increasing centralization and leadership. I mean, you know, now we have a system whereby, fewer people really have an impact. You know, we, we rely on the Speaker of the House or the Majority Leader and Minority Leader and, um, and, and you know, they kind of set the agenda and it, it becomes a lot more difficult for the rank and file members to have the level of impact that they want. And, you know, their job tends to be as, you know, we've heard famous examples of just, you know, spending all of their time fundraising um, at, at the expense of policy and, and constituent service. So, uh, in the ideal world, I think it's some balance between those two, between, you know, being focused on policy, getting a better understanding of, of issues that you may not know about, um, persuading your, uh, your fellow members, and, and hopefully having more time to interact with your fellow members so that you build deeper relationships and more respect for alternative points of view. Uh, and then, of course, not letting, you know, constituent service, which is obviously very important, um, you know, be overlooked. But I think that, you know, unfortunately, we probably have a situation where many members of Congress now spend... The, you know, a, a majority of their time on fundraising or, um, you know, in front of the TV camera uh, and, and, you know, promoting their own, just their own personal power. And, and I think part of the reason you see that again is because more traditional means of having an impact over the policy process don't exist. And so they just go to the court of public opinion and take advantage of, of, of media outlets. And, it, and it's oftentimes at the expense of uh, more nuanced, uh, deeper, um, you know, deeper policy, um, uh, I don't know, uh, understanding. And, and that's, that's where I would like to see that pendulum move more toward. So what percentage of time would you have the, them doing legislation versus constituent service? Can you, can you put a number on it? I'd probably say something like 40% for each of those and maybe 20% on fundraising would be what, I, what my gut would be. Um, I think that, you know, right now we're probably in a situation where you know, at least 50% for many of the members is spent on, on fundraising. And, and then when you add on again, you know, press uh, on top of that for many members, it's even more. And, you know, I think that policy is largely left to, to staff um, and, and which is fine. I mean, you know, obviously to some degree you need to have 
uh, specialization, but I think that it should never be a substitute for a level of understanding from members. Uh, and I think an attempt to gain expertise across the wide range of issues that they, they need to have expertise over. All right, next one is, um, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur uh, or be structured in Congress? You know, uh, so that, as I said earlier, I, that's one of those areas where I don't know that it necessarily needs to be as different from how things are now. I mean, um, you know, I think there are many people who are very concerned about polarization, and I, I share those to a point. But I, I also think that it's important that members are assertive. And I don't think that, you know, there should be this sort of, um, you know, we should think of Congress as just this kind of kumbaya institution where everyone is going to come together and, and have a good time with each other. I mean, it's never it's never been that way, and I don't think it ever ever will be. Um, but I do think that it's it's important that again members think about alternative ways of banding together beyond just the the sort of partisan way that seems to have taken um, you know taken primacy in the current uh, current political context. And that's where again. You know, looking at things like you know unifying people around power of the purse issues or or legislative capacity issues is a very useful framework, and I think that there's you know there are ways like that that we should sort of we should think about it, and and members and staff should work to structure their their alliances and realize that it's not just you know Republicans versus Democrats. There are many areas where there's a lot of agreement, and and I am the first to always say that you know I think that when I when I when I talk to you know family members or friends, I think there's this sort of this perception that people who are engaged in the policy process or you know, the think tank world um, have huge ideological disagreements. And that may be true in certain, you know, certain areas, you know, tax policy or healthcare or what have you, but even in those areas, there's far more agreement than we think. And that exists even in, in you know, with respect to members of Congress. So um, I think it's important to be collegial and to develop those relationships. Um, but we also, as outside observers, shouldn't expect that you know, members are gonna go and and, and be best buddies with one another, nor, nor should we want that to be the case. I think we should want a certain level of, of adversarialness between members and between branches of, of the government. I think that um, that will ultimately lead to the best outcomes. What fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Uh, well, budget process reform is certainly one. I mean, you know, it, I think there are a lot of ways we've, we've addressed already, but I think there, you know, focusing on fixing the budget process is very important. Um, and there are, you know, again, a lot of ways that that, that could be done. Um, so, you know, obviously I'm biased with respect to that, that issue. I think, again, also um, thinking about how to improve governance writ large is, is important. And so, you know, again, this is maybe a little redundant what we've already talked about, but congressional capacity is an important one. Um, I also think that, you know, we haven't talked too much about the regulatory front with respect to, to governance issues, but, um, you know, right now, a lot of regulatory decisions are also just delegated to executive agencies. And I think that that's troubling. I mean, you know, there have been attempts, I think, to have there be more regular congressional review of regulation. And the argument that's often made against that is that Congress, again, doesn't have the ability to do that. They don't even have the ability to do the things that they already are trying to do. And so um, I think that, I think that, you know, thinking about things not just from a, from a fiscal standpoint, but also from a regulatory standpoint would be important. And I think that increasing congressional capacity is an important, important part of that. And, and there are a whole host of other things that, you know, we could talk about. I mean, I think about things like, you know, war power declarations, for example, which have largely also been ceded to the executive branch that Congress, you know, arguably could be more involved in and should be more involved in. Um, things like that, I think, should be, should be re reformed in a way that, um, you know, again, just doesn't go and give power to the president, but, um, you know, reserves that power as, as in many cases, it, it constitutionally already should be um, to, the, to the legislature. So reforms that kind of, you know, uh, push us in that direction, I think are all very necessary. All right, next one is what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? Oh man, um, that is a good question. There are, there are a lot, I could probably talk, we could probably do a whole other call, uh, call event on this. Um, so I guess at a core level, um, I'm always a big fan of Anthony Downs, uh, you know, his economic theory of democracy and sort of thinking about actors within a system, um, you know, and, and Milton Friedman has riffed on this too, you know, this famous quote about, you know, it's not just about electing new people or better people, but, but about incentivizing the wrong people to do the right things. I find that quote, quote very persuasive. And I think that, you know, there's a, a long, rich tradition of, of thinking about, um, 
you know, thinking about governmental decision, the, the governmental decision making process in in a more structured way, rather than just focusing on the individual actors and their their individual motivations. Um, and and you know, there's a lot of game theory research. I mean, H. Peyton Young, uh, an economist who used to be at uh, um, Johns Hopkins, done a lot of work on sort of how various social norms can, you know, in a, sometimes inefficient social norms can end up being locked in inefficiently. I think that has a lot of relevance to Congress. Um, I think there's a lot of work from the more libertarian space. I think about James Buchanan or um, F.A. Hayek or Gordon Tullock and work on public choice, I think is oftentimes, uh, that's very much shaped my, my worldview on, on these issues. So, um, you know, and, and even in the electoral space, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of great work. Um, there's a great book, uh, I think it's called Making, Making Votes Count, um, but it basically talks about the rules in the electoral context um, by can't forget, I can't remember the name of the political scientist now, but um, but the, the general theme, the things that have impacted me the most is sort of thinking about the system writ large and how the rules have an impact and, and to be clear, the limitations of reforms to those rules so that we're not just kind of thinking that, you know, if we just had this perfect fiscal rule or we just had this perfect, uh, you know, rule that, that um, you know, governs this specific thing that Congress or the government does and thinking that that's going to solve our problem. There, there is sort of a there is this broader question about incentivizing the people who are in office to feel compelled to do the right thing. Right. So last question here is what are your, what plans do you have for the long term? Obviously you've, you've been done a lot of things with the budget and you're thinking about congressional capacity in the long term, where do you see your, your own kind of arc evolving over time in terms of your yeah. research interests, in terms of, um, you know, subject matter? Yeah, I mean, you know, as you know, I have been an evangelist for uh, for better data, for more transparency, for using technology to solve some of these problems. Um, I think it's an area where there's the potential for huge value add. And frankly, I think that you know, I and and you know, the, the, those of us who are in this space haven't really even begun to scratch the surface. Uh, I think there are a lot better tools that can be can be built to understand better what government is doing for for you know. Uh, outside, you know, citizens to hold their elected members accountable, um, and to just generally increase transparency over the process. And, you know, I, I mean, just to give a sense of, of how far we've come, I mean, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the ability to have an API for just votes in Congress. Well, that that's only existed since 2009, you know, 11 years ago, that I think it was, um, you know, a couple of outside groups built that tool, it might have even been the New York Times initially. Um, and, and, you know, so you think about it, even prior to 2009, we didn't even really have great structured data on how votes were being taken, let alone the implications of those votes. And just now we're starting to get tools. I mean, you know, there's been, I mean, the ability to do something like spending tracker has existed for a long time, but, you know, just things like needing to digitize congressional budget office reports, which, you know, was a part of this project. It wasn't like we could just go and tap into this pre-existing data and crunch the numbers. It required literally reading, I think it was over 6,000 CBO reports over the last decade, and then digitizing all of them. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for better structured data, and then building tools on top of that data. And, um, and so there's all, you know, there is all of the other, um, I think, issue advocacy type of stuff that, you know, we talked about with respect to um, the ongoing fiscal debates that are occurring uh, now with respect to how we handle coronavirus, um, with respect to how we, you know, implement budget process reform. But I think that the, the ultimate answer to how we're going to be able to get better fiscal outcomes is really going to come from you know, whether or not we're able to, to build tools that are useful for, for citizens and for members and for their staff to better understand the process um, and, to, and to ultimately have some level of accountability. I think it's a, it may not be sufficient, but it's definitely a, a necessary condition. And that's, that's where I see my work moving even more toward. Great. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a great talk. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great discussion. Thank you.